Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so uh, I'm Scott Yi. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Andrew Martins today um, as our speaker. So, Andrew is uh, currently a PhD student in this uh, special joint program with um, CMU and uh, CMU Portugal um, program in language technologies um, and uh, working with Noah Smith, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, um, Andrew has done a lot of good work in both machine learning and natural language processing. Um, and his work um, titled Concise Integer Linear Programming Formulation for um, Dependency Parsing um, has won the Best Paper Award in ACL 2009. Um, and today, Andrew is going to tell us how to solve a uh, structural output prediction problem um, using his methods based on uh, dual decomposition. OK. Uh, thanks, Scott, for introducing me. <coughs> so uh, yeah, so this is joint work with my four advisors, No Smith, Mari Figuredo, Peter Giar, and Eric Shing. Uh, all right. So, uh, so I, I, this talk is divided into two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, inference algorithms, uh, in particular, uh, a new dual decomposition method uh, for doing inference when there are many overlapping components. Uh, and in the second half, uh, I'm going to talk about the learning problem and particularly uh, how to do uh, structured uh, sparse modeling uh, for structure prediction uh, in NLP. So let's start with the, with the, with the inference uh, part. Uh, so this is based on uh, two papers, one uh, presented this year at MNLP and another, uh, another one at uh, ICML where uh, it was more focused on uh, you know, general graphical models. The MNLP one was particularly uh, to parsing. Um, and so the basic idea, uh, and I think this is more close to the MNLP talk, so it's more uh, directed to an uh, NLP uh, kind of audience. Uh, so the basic idea is that um, we have, we have uh, been dealing with statistical models for many different tasks in NLP, and you usually can improve accuracy uh, as you keep breaking uh, locality assumptions and uh, endow these models with more, uh, with richer uh, features. Um, and so the, the downside of this is that in many cases uh, you can no longer do exact inference uh, in a tractable way and we need to use approximate decoding methods. Uh, you know, there are many different things that have been proposed like sampling based methods, using search, uh, using LP relaxations. Uh, here I'm going to focus on the LP relaxations based methods. Um, and one method that uh, gained, gained prominence uh, in NLP quite recently, uh, which was actually introduced in vision problems by uh, Komodakis, uh, is dual decomposition, which gives us a principled way uh, of combining models. Uh, it works by uh, relaxing uh, the original problem and then uh, optimizing the dual with the subgradient method. I'm going to talk uh, in detail about this uh, soon. Uh, and it has uh, shown very good performance in NLP problems, uh, in parsing, in MT, uh, and other sort of problems. Uh, but uh, all this past work uh, have been focusing in combining just a few models. And here uh, I'll be concerned with massive decompositions in which you have many uh, overlapping pieces uh, in, in our models. And so we are going to present an alternative dual decomposition algorithm uh, based on the alternating directions uh, method of multipliers. Uh, that is particularly uh, suitable when you have to deal with these kinds of massive decompositions. All right, so uh, there are many applications of these. I'm going to focus here on parsing, but we can use this virtually for any kind of constrained conditional models with you know, first order Markov logic constraints uh, on top of that. Uh, and so this is quite general and can be used in many different applications. Okay, so just to uh, provide a basic idea of the task that we are going to address here, which is dependency parsing, this is what the dependency tree uh, looks like. 
So we have a tree like this. We actually sh I should have replaced Edinburgh by Seattle here. It should make sense as well. But so, uh, so this is a dependency tree uh, for this sentence. It's a rooted tree. Uh, this is the root node. Uh, and it spans all the words uh, in the sentence. And so we, we want to um, predict a structure like this. So just to try to give some intuition about what this means, there is a subject here, which is it. There is an object, uh, so there is rain, which is a predicate. Uh, there is a, a prepositional phrase uh, in the city of Edinburgh. And so these arrows are essentially representing uh, the grammatical functions uh, of, of the words. And so you want to predict something like this. Uh, and we are going to consider models that uh, have a bunch of scores for different pieces of this tree. Uh, so you'll have scores for the arcs uh, that look at two words and consider including an arc between these two words. Uh, we'll have scores for consecutive siblings. Uh, so these are essentially words that, uh, so these words, it and rain, are both children of does. Uh, and they are on the same side and they are consecutive. Uh, we are also going to consider scores for uh, you know, these grandparent structures like these. Uh, also for arbitrary siblings, not necessarily consecutive. Um, and also for directed paths. So we, are, we have a score that reflects uh, how likely our two words to share to be in the same path. So, yeah, so in this case, I guess it will be like a high score uh, because Rain and Seattle or Rain on Edinburgh would likely to be in the same path. So, uh, yeah, so we also have scores for this, like two consecutive words looking at the heads, uh, at the parents of these two words. And you want to, oh, you want to also have this. So I'm going to skip some details here, but uh, so essentially non projective arcs are arcs that cross each other. Um, and we also have scores for uh, pairs of arcs or for arcs that have other uh, arcs crossing it. Uh, so this is useful in, in actual NLP parsing. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, dual decomposition. So this is our setup. We have some input X, which in this case is a sentence. We have some structured output Y, uh, which is a parse tree. Uh, and we are going to represent y as a binary vector uh, that essentially is an indicator vector of the basic parts that are active in the output. So in the, in the, in the, in the parsing example, uh, each, each of these basic parts is going to be a candidate arc. And if, if the, that entry is 1, it means that the arc belongs to the tree. And if it's 0, it means that we are not using that arc. Does that make sense? Possible. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so you have we start with a uh, you know complete graph connecting all the words, um, and and yeah, and you have like a linear number of ones here. Okay, so and you have um, so we suppose that you have some model that gives a score to each parse tree, and the goal is to predict by uh, finding the parse tree that maximizes this score, uh, and so. The scores that I'm going to talk about here are going to be linear scores, uh, just uh, you know, a linear function of parameters uh, and features. Um, and uh, so a technique that is used uh, quite often to increase the expressive power uh, of models like these is to com compose, uh, combine two models by, uh, I'm being very informal here, but suppose that I have two views of the output y uh, that I'm calling Z1 and Z2 here. And I have two different score functions for each of the views. And I just define uh, the score of a parse tree as the sum of these two individual scores. But I assume that, L1, uh, that Z1 and Z2 are two overlapping views uh, in the sense that you know, they, we are going to see what these mean uh, later. Um, but so in this case, the prediction problem uh, becomes that of maximizing uh, the sum of the two scores with respect to Z1 and Z2, which you know, belong to their own spaces. Uh, and we have this constraint that they have to agree on their overlaps. And so this notation is just an informal notation that you know, uh, says that you need to say something about uh, these two views agree with each other. Uh, 
So this is for two components, but you can imagine that we uh, combine, that you have more than two. Uh, and so it's, it is a very uh, uh, simplified view of the problem. We suppose that you have some complex uh, object Y. Uh, we have represented it as a vector of basic parts, arcs in the, in the dependency tree, for example. Uh, and we are going to consider several views uh, of this object. Um, this could be, for example, the siblings or grandparents and the other uh, uh, score functions that I described uh, in the beginning. Uh, so those will induce other parts, which are going to be these higher order uh, things that are not necessarily arcs, but conjunctions of arcs, for example. Uh, and there is some overlap between all these views. Uh, and we have the constraint that they must be consistent on the overlaps. And so the goal is to, uh, we want to reconstruct Y by gluing together uh, all these views, Z1 to ZS. Uh, and I'm arguing that this is a recurrent problem uh, in NLP uh, in which we want to use some local evidence and we want to glue everything and form a global meaning uh, that you know, uh, is consistent and collects all these local evidence. Yes? trying to understand this overlapping term. So one thing is to say that they agree on the overlap. It's a different to say that there is exist there exists a Y such so that if you view it from the Z the three direction you'll see that and, and B2 you'll see that. So are you explicitly saying that it's just that the overlap agree or do you mean that also there exists Y such so that the projections will be exactly the Z1, Z2, Z3? Yeah, that's, that's the second thing that you mentioned. So I'm assuming that uh, z the, all the z's should be consistent in a way that there exists some well-defined y that uh, you know, collects all this information from the different views. Uh, so in, in the parsing example, uh, the z1 to zs could be, for example, you know, a grandparent, like two arcs. Uh, and of course, there will be some overlap between different structures like these. And I'm uh, requiring that uh, the arcs that these two structures share uh, have to be consistent, uh, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's uh, make this more formal. Uh, so we make the score decompose as a sum over individual scores. Uh, and this is the problem that we want to solve. But to make all the Z's consistent, we are going to add a witness vector that we call U. And we are going to make sure that all these components match this witness vector. Okay? So this, the, this witness vector uh, uh, is indexed by the basic parts, or the arcs in the dependency tree. And, and this constraint makes sure that all the arcs in these substructures uh, have to match some common witness vector. And this is going to force agreement between all uh, the overlaps in the different components. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, all right, so this is an equivalent problem. This is what we want to solve. Um, and so this problem can be intractable. Uh, and actually for non-projective dependency parsing, uh, it becomes NP hard to solve this uh, with the features that I described. Uh, and so uh, a technique that, uh, an approximate way of solving the problem is to consider a linear relaxation is, uh, of, of, of this problem in which we replace uh, these sets uh, ys, so the set, the set the, uh, corresponding to each view, to its convex, uh, to its convex hull. Uh, and so I'm skipping some details here, but if you think in terms of graphical models, this is exactly the same thing as approximating the marginal polytope by the local polytope, which is an outer bound. Uh, of the, 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 you know, the set that contains all valid marginal, marginals for that graphical model. So this is something that is commonly done. Um, and um, in, in, in this problem and in many other problems, uh, the, the gap, uh, the relaxation gap is not going to be too large. And so you can still do something useful by solving this relaxation. Uh, OK, so essentially, we have replaced y of x by the convex hull. Uh, and so the next thing to do is to dualize this problem by introducing uh, Lagrange variables, uh, lambda sub s of r, for these constraints. So we are going to dualize this out. 
and then uh, we are going to solve the dual by using the projected subgradient method. Relaxation that you're doing is, is for the arcs are binary variables, so you're relaxing yeah. it to zero, one, the interval. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Yeah, so for this parsing problem, that's exactly what I'm doing. So I'm essentially, yeah. Uh, yeah. So any further questions at this point? Right. So okay, so if, you, if I skip all the math that, uh, um, you know, uh, is implied by this uh, projective subgradient method applied to this problem, we end up with an algorithm that looks like this. So we first initialize all the Lagrange multipliers to zero. Uh, and then you have a loop uh, in which, at each point, we are going to look at each component, S. Uh, we are going to make a z-step, which is essentially involves maximizing the score of that uh, subproblem, plus a linear term that involves Lagrange variables. Um, and so this is as hard as, uh, because the score is linear, if, if the score functions are also linear, if f, of, uh, if f sub x is linear, this is still linear, and so this is uh, as hard as uh, you know, computing the map for uh, that particular component. Uh, and so then we aggregate uh, all the ZS that we obtain uh, in the Z-step. We compute the average. So here, uh, this delta uh, of R is essentially the number uh, of uh, components where the, basic arc, uh, where the basic part R appears. So this is an average. Uh, so you, you aggregate everything, we average, uh, and then you do an update of the Lagrange multipliers that essentially subtracts out the average. Uh, and there is a, you know, a step size which has to be diminishing and all that for this to converge, this A to T. Um, and uh, so this algorithm is guaranteed to converge for uh, the solution of the LP relaxation. Um, and it can happen that you can find the certificate uh, if at some point in the algorithm uh, all, all these ZS are going to agree with each other. So if that happens, uh, which is going to mean that UR is also going to agree with everyone, then we know that we are done. And we, that can only happen if there is no relaxation gap. So if the solution is actually integer. Or you can just define the maximum number of iterations and stop after that. No, this is, this is, the, this is the deal decomposition using the subgradient method. It looks kind of like, uh, well, non-augmented Lagrangian. You're updating your Lagrangian multipliers by the negative, the positive, the gradient with respect to the Lagrangian multipliers. So this looks very much like it. Oh, so, I, I f so I'm maximizing and not minimizing. Mm -hmm. so, so this is actually a standard gradient, gradient update. Yeah, but, but the, this lambda step is going to be the same for ADMM. And actually, you are going to see later how to take this algorithm and change it slightly to become uh, ADMM. Uh, OK. So. OK, so this is what I just said. Um, and so the problem here is that if you have many components, this is going to become very slow. Uh, you know, because I'm trying to reach a consensus between many things that are overlapping, and it's going to be slow to get that consensus. Uh, and so by the way, the only thing that is pushing for a consensus here is this term here, where that makes the Lagrange multipliers intervene. Right? So Lagrange multipliers are going to be set to try to get agreement between all these ZS. Uh, but so in ADMM, we are going to get uh, you know, something stronger that pushes for agreement. OK, so let's talk about the ADMM algorithm. Um, so the goal is to accelerate the decomposition. There have been several, um, a couple of approaches that try to do that. One by Vladimir Jovic, Daphne Koller, and some other authors, where they essentially smooth uh, the objective function by adding uh, an entropic prior. Uh, an entropic term. Uh, and then, because the objective becomes differentiable, they can just use gradient methods. Uh, so in this case, they're, I think they used an, this nester of uh, fast gradient techniques. And they managed to uh, accelerate uh, you know, dual decomposition by doing that. We're going to do something different, uh, which is considering the augmented Lagrangian uh, of, of this problem and using the, the alternating direction method of multipliers. So, oh, this, is, this was proposed in the, in the ICML paper. And so the, this is an old method in optimization. Uh, it goes back to the 70s. Um, there, is a, there seems to be a recent surge of interest. Uh, there is a recent monograph by Stefan Boyd and others 
on this method applied for many different problems. Uh, and so in the, in the ICML paper, we uh, describe how to apply this for general graphical models. So here the focus is more parsing, but uh, this is quite general. And so how can we start from the subgradient algorithm and uh, obtain the ADMM algorithm? Uh, so there's just a couple of changes that we need to do. First of all, we need to initialize uh, the U variables, and you're just going to initialize it to uniform. So you know, recall that we are going to, so all these parts are binary variables, so we are just saying that we don't have any evidence about the part to be one or zero. Um, and you are going to add this additional quadratic term uh, in the Z step, which is essentially um, keeping track of the residual between uh, the ZS uh, variables and the U variable that has the average of everyone. So essentially, it's like in the previous round, we have computed the average of these votes. So you can regard these ES as votes. We computed the average of the votes. And now you are regularizing towards this average. And so this is the reason why this is pushing for a faster consensus. Because it, in some sense, it gives some basic information about what everyone has predicted in the previous round. Uh, usually, if people do augmented Lagrangians to make sure it converges, whether it's usually there's a, a non-zero row that ensures convergence when, when your other terms are <coughs> non-linear. I mean, that's what I've seen. Uh, is it really faster? I mean, you have proof that it's faster? Uh, so I think that it's an open problem to actually show the convergence rate of ADMM. And like, so I'm skipping some details here, but so pure augmented Lagrangian methods would do some, some things differently. They will do a joint optimization of U and ZS. So they will do a joint optimization of U and Z. And then they, do, they just use this uh, multiplier update here. The problem is that if you, you cannot do that, I mean, it's not efficient because this term is coupling the two variables together. And so ADMM essentially, instead of doing this joint optimization, it, it does like uh, coordinate. Uh, so it optimizes first with respect to Z and then with respect to U. And that is the basic difference between ADMM and, uh, and, and uh, augmented Lagrangians. Um, does that make sense? Uh, Isn't it also smooth? In this case, you have the object function is this is smooth. Essentially, you no longer using a subgrade. So the, the objective function is the same. This is just an artifact of the method. Uh, so this quadratic term is something that's... Uh, it disappears at the minimum, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Forgot to mention that. So that's why this is a residual. So in, if, if, the, if, you, if you are... So in the... In the even in the LP relaxation, any uh, primal feasible solution of the relaxed problem, uh, will, uh, this thing will be zero, and so this term should vanish, right? Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, all right, so the second small difference is that you don't need to anneal uh, this learning rate here, and like in the subgradient method. You can just keep it fixed. Uh, and yeah, so in ADMM... Your dual problem in terms of uh, lambda variable is a differentiable smooth problem. So that's precisely that's a gradient mask, no longer a subgradient mask. Oh, you mean? Uh, yeah, I mean the dual function. Is the, okay, the dual. Okay, I see. So because, because okay, the problem yeah. you the, 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 yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. I see. What, I see what you mean. So you can also modify your primal problem by adding the residual term, which is a, a dummy term because it's going to be zero at the optimal. Uh, and you can derive the dual of that. That's what you're saying. And you get a smooth dual, which is, uh, you get this, yeah. And so this can be regarded as a method, yeah. Uh, yeah, so th 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 there is this useful thing that you don't need to annul this and like, you know, uh, it's a gradient method. Um, okay, so this means that you, you because this is one of the reasons that make the subgradient method slow. You need to annul these step sizes, which means that your updates to the dual variables are going to be smaller and smaller, and it's going to take more time to make progress. Uh, all right, so in addition, there are some better topic conditions. So even if you have a relaxation gap, we can keep track of a primal and the dual residual. Uh, so this residual term is giving that information. Uh, and we can stop our algorithm if we are below some threshold. And so this gives us a, m a method to stop the algorithm even if, we have, even if you don't have a certificate 
for the exact problem, right? Uh, okay, so any questions so far? Uh, all right, so the only thing that's remaining here is how to solve this problem. And, and this is, uh, you know, uh, something, it's, it's a complication that the ADMM algorithm introduced with respect to the subgradient one. Because there are many cases, uh, so this is in the Z step. Uh, so there are many problems. Oh, so we are going to assume that uh, the score of each component is linear. Uh, and in that case, this becomes a quadratic problem because of the residual term. Uh, and so in the, in the subgradient methods, you didn't have this term, and so the entire thing was linear, which means that if you have a component that is, you know, uh, like a combinatorial piece of our problem, we can use combinatorial algorithms uh, to solve. Like, for example, if you have a sequence model as, one of the com or as, as, as a component, you can use Viterbi to determine, uh, like, uh, the most likely uh, path in that sequence. Or in the, in the dependency parsing case, you can use combinatorial algorithms for determining spanning trees. It depends on what your subproblem is. Uh, but all these uh, nice combinatorial algorithms cannot be used if you have this quadratic term. And so it becomes harder uh, to solve the z-step if you have like a, a complex subproblem. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's a QP, so you can use any QP solver. But the point is that if, 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 uh, if, your, component, if your component is very large, uh, some of these combinatorial algorithms are very efficient at solving that exactly, and, you, and it's, more, it's harder to solve the QP. So if you're really concerned about speed, and you need to solve this several times during ADMM, uh, you know, this, could, this can be a drawback. Yeah, exactly. And that's something that we do, and there's all sorts of tricks that you can do, and, and that are very helpful. And also, you don't need to solve the QP exactly. There is a result by Eckstein and Bersex in the 90s. They show that the ADMM still converges if you just approximately solve the QP as soon as the something like the sum of residuals have to be summable. I don't remember the details. But uh, as soon as, as you, you are uh, at each iteration you are sol solving the QPs more and more exactly, then you should be fine. Uh, Okay, so in, but, but there are some cases that we can address, and I'm, I'm going to talk about those. And in particular, uh, if you have any component that expresses a first order logic constraint, we can still solve the QP exactly and efficiently. Uh, and this is quite useful in NLP models because often you want to inject uh, some constraints into the model uh, you know, to encode some prior knowledge that you have about the problem at hand. So, okay, so an example, this is like a simple example. Suppose that, that the component is just composed of three variables, two variables Z1 and Z2 that we had in the model, and it just had a third variable that is the conjunction of these two. So this can be useful if you want to make our model richer by including a potential for, you know, the simultaneous inclusion of these two parts. Uh, and so it happens in parsing in these cases. Uh, so in this case, Z1, Z1, Z2 is like the conjunction of these two arcs, and we have the same thing for the siblings and the add diagram features. Uh, and so in that case, uh, the convex hull of the set corresponding to this component is going to be uh, a tetrahedron, it's just like this, essentially. So essentially it's just saying that uh, if Z1 and Z2 are both one, Z1, 2 has to be one, uh, so there is this vertex here, otherwise you have these three vertices, and after the convex hull it becomes these, and solving uh, the subproblem in this case, as a closed form solution, it's quite efficient to compute it. And so this is a, a case that you can deal with. And so with these, you can essentially tackle any uh, easing model uh, in, a, in a graphical model, because this will be like edge potentials. Uh, all right, so the next example is uh, uniqueness quantification. So suppose that you have a group of n variables, uh, n binary variables, we require that exactly one of those variables uh, can be one, and all the others have to be zero. So it's like a, a selector of the variables. Um, so in that case, um, this is what uh, the, you know, the, the, the output set for, for this subproblem uh, uh, means. So essentially, you are look, it's any, any binary vector such that uh, the sum is one, right? Uh, and so if you take the convex all of that, it's just a probability simplex. 
and the z step is just projecting onto the simplex. Uh, and so this problem can be solved efficiently and exactly by just uh, sorting all the entries uh, in this vector and applying uh, a soft thresholding operation. And so this can be done in n log n, and in practice it's faster if, you, if we cache the previous solution if, or if you warm start, uh, like if you store the last sort that we did for this problem. Um, okay, so this is a nice case. Um, and it turns out that we also have a similar result for other uh, first order logic constraints. So in this case, we take a group of n variables and require that at least one of the variables is one, but there can be more than one variables uh, with one value. Um, and so in that case, uh, essentially we require that the disjunction of the variables is one. And essentially the, the, the output set in this case it's just a, you know, uh, a faulty hypercube where you just remove the origin because the origin is the only thing that does not satisfy this constraint, right? And so projecting uh, onto this thing can also be done efficiently by sorting. Uh, so the ICML paper describes this in more detail, but uh, it's also very efficient to do this. Uh, so there are other examples involving first order logic constraints. Uh, for example, you can introduce uh, a new variable uh, to the model, which is the disjunction of existing variables. This is something useful, uh, again, to make our model richer by adding a specific potential for this new variable. Um, and so in that case, you obtain you know, a nice polytope as well, and you can also solve this with a, with a sort. In this case, it's a little more tricky, but you can do it. Uh, and yeah, so this can be extended if we negate inputs, uh, and you can essentially deal with any first order logic constraint by doing this. So everything is just solvable with sort operations. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to uh, show some experiments here. Um, so the experiments are in non-projective dependency parsing. Uh, I also did some experiments in uh, you know, synthetic graphical models in the ICML paper, but I'm just going to skip those. Uh, and so here, uh, I just used data sets from um, so data sets from kernel tasks, which are a common, a common data sets for different languages that have annotations uh, for these dependency trees. And the goal is to train a parser and then evaluate it uh, in a test validation set, in a test set. Um, and so to train, we just use the, the Myra algorithm, which is an online algorithm. Uh, you can think of it as an online version of the, of the structured SVM algorithm. I'm going to skip details on that. Um, and finally, because this is an approximate method, if you really want an exact solution, uh, we need to do some rounding to obtain a valid tree. And it turns out that it's quite, we can come up with a very simple rounding strategy that just looks at the, the arc entries in the vector. Um, and then uh, you, you take those things as scores and use a combinatorial algorithm to, give, to, to, to obtain the closest uh, valid tree to that vector. Uh, and so you did that. And actually, we usually obtain exact solutions. It's the, the fraction of fractional, the percentage of fractional solutions that we get is quite small. Um, and I think that this, is, this deserves further study. But I think the reason for that is that we actually train also with the LP relaxation. And this is pushing the model to uh, favor uh, exact solutions and avoid eating fractional vertices. Uh, anyway, so uh, this is the result that we have obtained. Oh, so we, we, we tr actually tried two kinds of models with uh, different feature sets. This is, the, this is a model that just uses um, arc features and second order features for siblings, consecutive siblings and, and grandparents. And this is the results with a full set of features, so there is some improvement. Um, uh, so we are you know, hitting that baseline. And this is where the best published results stand. So, yeah, so this compares a bunch of different methods that have been used for, for parsing. We don't win for all languages, but we get state of the art for eight of these uh, 14. And we are pretty close for the others. Um, right, so this is the ones that we are winning. Um, all right, so. This is just giving a flavor of 
how faster is the ADMM algorithm compared with the subgradient method. So this is plotting uh, as a function of the number of iterations. Um, it's plotting the accuracy that we get in the validation set, okay? Average over, um, no, so uh, yeah, so this is like, there are different runs here, one for each instance in the test set, uh, and we are keeping track of the accuracies that we get if we define a uh, maximum number of iterations for uh, the subgradient algorithm and for the ADMM algorithm. And so you can see that ADMM usually uh, gives a more accurate res response sooner, uh, earlier than the subgradient methods. And so here we are using, you know, a considerable number of components, but still not that, mu not that many. Uh, if we increase this further, um, and so this is a second order model, if you, if you do this for the full, mo oh, sorry. So this is another thing. This is showing the percentage of certificates that we get with the subgradient methods and with the ADMM algorithm. So we also get more certificates. This means that we can actually stop our algorithm sooner. And this is showing uh, if, we, if we define a threshold on the primal dual residuals, this is showing the percentage of instances that we can safely stop. Uh, okay, so, and this is for the full model. And here the results are much more impressive. So here I, we have much more, um, many more components on average thousands of components and in the worst case, hundreds of thousands. So there are many overlapping pieces here. And this is the results that we get with the subgradient method and with the ADMM algorithm. So eventually this red line would catch up the blue line, but we, it will just take too many iterations to get there. Um, and so ADMM uh, you know, makes a good job at after say 200 or 300 iterations already, is already uh, on uh, you know, the best performance that we will achieve for the updates in the two cases pretty similar? That, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, it's almost, it's not exactly the same because so the subgradient method um, is a, uh, instead of n log n, it's, uh, it's just linear uh, for, for those components. Uh, so there is a, like a log, log n uh, difference here. But that sort of gets washed away if we cache the subproblems, and I'm going to show that in the next slide. So it, you can say that it's approximately the same. Um, and the 200 is 200 swoops through all the components? So uh, yeah, so I'm also going to, because it, it turns out that it doesn't need to revisit some components. I'm going to talk about that next. But yes, it, it, it will do that. So I can use a sense of how long, so this is like one parse, right? Oh yeah, so this is very fast. So I think the average parsing time is, uh, no. It's less than one second. It's like less than half a second. So it's fast on average. So uh, I'm wondering that uh, if you use a gradient method, then each sub product is a still a linear product, then probably you can have a bigger component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, when you do this kind of comparison, when you use ADM, and then you are forced to use smaller components. So I'm not so sure this comparison is. That, it's, that's it's, 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 it's okay, but I'm not so sure it's that, that, That's a good point. I actually, I skipped some slides, but so if you go to the previous one, this, this is a fair comparison for the second order models because so here, so that there is one constraint in the parse tree, which is a tree constraint that you, you want to enforce the whole thing to be a well-defined tree. And so there is a, you know, a, a large component that you can use in the subgradient method to enforce that constraint. And here we are using that. So the subgradient method is using one large component for that tree, and the ADMM method, because it cannot do anything useful because of the quadratic term, it's splitting that tree constraint into many small pieces, and so it has, that's why it has more components on average with respect to the subgradient method. So this comparison is fair. Uh, and the next one, oh, the next one is also fair, yeah. So, uh, so here we did the same thing. Um, uh, sorry, not here, but here. Oh, actually, okay, so here we tried that for the subgradient method using a tree, but because some of our features require, you know, examining some things that are needed anyways in, in if we split that tree constraint into smaller pieces, uh, it didn't give any advantage to use the tree. So it was actually better to split it also in the subgradient method because we need to reuse some of the, it's kind of hard to explain. Maybe we can talk offline about that. But uh, yeah, so this is, 
all a fair comparison. Now, there are weaker models that are not including as, uh, as you know, complex features as this one, in which you could come up with, uh, with coarse decompositions in the subgradient method. Those are, for example, what uh, you know, Michael Collins and Terry Koo and Sasha Rush used. Um, and so in that case, the subgradient method is efficient. So this is like, uh, there are some scenarios where the subgradient method is more suitable than ADMM. ADMM is better if you don't want to concern about how to find a good decomposition, or if no such good decomposition exists. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I guess I had that in, in some slides, but I removed it. You're saying that for the ADMM case, you, you had to do the breakup into the small components because the quadratic term, but you could use that same breakdown for the subgradient method as well if you wanted to, right? And yeah. then couldn't you reuse, cache the, the results? Yes, yeah. but, 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 but it was slow. It's much slower. Mu much, much slower. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even plot that here, but it was really, really slow. Yeah, and that, so actually here I, I did that because, as I said, here you, you don't gain anything by using the tree constraint. So in this full model, not the second order model, in this full, full model, this is actually using all these small pieces and caching and all that. But, all right, so. Uh, okay, so yeah, again, we can uh, you know, stop this if we uh, fall below some threshold because of the primal dual residual information. And this is like the impact of caching here. Uh, so it turns out that caching can give a substantial speed up. So this is essentially showing the percentage of subproblems that we need to solve. Uh, and you can see that you know, after, say, 300 iterations, we only need to touch like 20% of the factors, actually less than that. Yeah, so yeah, we need to touch like 20% of the factors. You don't? What is we mean by caching here? Oh yeah, so it means that so for, as we keep going, iterating in the ADMM algorithm, many of these problems became exactly the same as in the previous round. And so you don't need to solve them again. You can just cache the solution. But we need to do some sort of smart caching because you don't, you don't actually need, to, you don't want to examine the input of those problems because it's actually a linear lookup as well. But you can, you can do that and, and it saves a lot of time. Uh, okay, yeah, so you are, you are the running time. So this is like 0 0.34 seconds per sentence. Oh, uh, I, I don't really know, but it's probably something like 20 words per sentence. Or, but there, it varies a lot. So it, it, the average length doesn't give much information because these, the algorithms are, are not linear in terms of the sentence length. And so if you get a large, a long sentence, that is going to dominate, right? Uh, but it's like, you know, sentences that appear in newspaper corpus. We didn't filter out any sentence. Um, all right, so this concludes the first part of the talk. Um, yeah. So this is, we have presented a new variant of dual decomposition. Uh, which is faster to reach a consensus. It's suitable for problems with many overlapping components. There are some advantages and disadvantages with respect to the subgradient method. So unlike the subgradient method, this doesn't allow us, at least in an obvious way, to reuse combinatorial machinery to solve the subproblems because you have this quadratic term. Although, you know, there are some ideas that we could try to do something smart here to reuse this machinery, but that's something that we can discuss, discuss afterwards. Um, but on the other hand, in many cases, for example, in first order, uh, every time you have first order logic constraints, you can actually compute this step in closed form in an efficient way. So this is um, a good thing to use if you have uh, you know, these models in a, like constrained conditional models and models in, in which we actually inject these kind of constraints. And there's a lot of future work. Uh, so this ADMM algorithm is quite general. It could be used in many different problems. Uh, you know, there's, there are factors that I didn't talk about here, but suppose that you have something like a budget constraint, those, those kinds of things appear in summarization. For example, you want to summarize a document and you have like a budget of say 100, and one, 100 words that you can use. Um, you can actually have like a, you know, a, a, a sub-problem that restricts the number of words to a particular number and you can still solve the quadratic problem in you know, an efficient way by doing that. 
Um, yeah, so there is also ways of tightening these towards exact decoding. And I think this will be a very nice, uh, if, it, if this works, which is not, we still need to work out the theoretical details. Uh, so hybridizing the subgradient and ADMM will give the benefits of allowing us to reuse the combinatorial machinery. So the idea here is to let some uh, uh, components not having the quadratic penalty and just use them for other components. So essentially, if you have something like a sequence model or a tree model, we don't use the quadratic penalty there. And so you can use combinatorial machinery or combinatorial algorithms to solve the LPs. Uh, and, but if you have like first order logic constraints, we put the penalty there and that is going to accelerate consensus. And so it's an open question if this hybridization will work. Uh, I believe it would. In, in practice, it seems to do something decent. Uh, and so it will offer uh, a good way of solving real world problems. Okay, so is there any uh, question regarding this first half? So, so, you had, um, so you talked about some of the situations in which you could use the closed form Z step. So when in the process of, of running through your uh, data set, so if you had cases where you could use those, you just take those and treat those outside of this optimization and said, well, I just have a closed form solution for these guys, you know, and then let everything else go through the the whichever method we're using. So you just treated those guys separately, or uh, so the, those. Yeah, the, the, that go. The, so uh, the, the model is such. The model that I that I am using mm -hmm. is such that any feature in that model can be framed as like a first order logic constraint like this, and so I could always solve the Z step uh, efficiently in closed form using these techniques, basically sorting. But not, but not all trees that you had would break down into, not all the components would, would turn out to be closed form solvable components, right? Yeah, I, I skipped some details, but so it turns out that if you, if you take like the, this dependency parsing task in which you have like a, like a, a component that constrains all arcs to, together to define a tree, you can, uh, you can enforce that constraint uh, by a sequence of formulas in first order logic. We need to do some lifting. So I skipped the details because it's a little complicated. But you can, you can, uh, you have a multi-commodity flow formulation for that problem. So you can essentially impose that um, the the arcs that we get uh, are uh, essentially defining a connected graph, and that is going to uh, imply that we have a tree. And to, to imply connectedness, you can uh, use path variables and flow variables. It's a little complicated, but you can do everything, and that's what we did. So th that's what I meant by splitting the large piece into smaller pieces. It's essentially splitting that tree constraint into a set of first order logic constraints. Oh, so, you could split, so, so you could, in general, split yeah. all the constraints in your front end problems into those yeah. components. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is quite general. So we, if you have, suppose that you have like a pairwise graphical model where the variables are, m uh, are uh, not binary, but they can take multiple labels. So if you have like a you know, POTS model or something like that, you can also uh, transform that graph into a binary graph that uses uh, you know, some of these XOR factors that I showed there. Uh, and then you can apply this. So there are, it's usually easy to take uh, like a, a big component and to split it into small components. But it might not be the best way of solving the problem because it may turn out that if you don't have many overlaps, subgradient is already a good approach. It really depends on your model and yeah. But so it's kind of an open problem. So I, I think that there's some hope that you can still tackle these large factors with the quadratic penalty there. For example, there are ways of uh, solving a QP that implies solving a sequence of, of LPs, okay? And so by using that, we could solve our QPs by, you know, repeatedly uh, using these combinatorial algorithms. Okay, uh, any further questions before I proceed to the second half? All right. So, okay. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, structured sparsity uh, in structure prediction. Um, and so, 
uh, right, so this is based on uh, uh, another EMLP paper. And the paper that we, it's, it's vaguely related with the paper that we presented at AI Stats this year. Uh, with kernels, which is not the setting that we're going to consider here. Um, and so the basic idea is that uh, we, in many cases, we care about uh, sparsity uh, in NLP models for several reasons. Because you may want a compact model, uh, or because you care about runtime, and it turns out that that sparsity can also affect runtime, and you're going to see this in more detail later. Uh, or because you just, you cannot afford the large memory footprint. Uh, or because you actually want to interpret the model and try to understand what is relevant in our model. Um, and so there is a lot of previous work um, that uh, addresses sparsity, but usually it's just focusing on penalizing cardinality uh, through a L1 regularization term and ignores uh, the structure of the feature space. So here the idea is to take the structure of the feature space into account. Uh, and so what this is what this talk is about. Uh, all right, so, um, okay, so here is our setup. We, again, it's the same setup that we have in the, in the previous talk, in the previous uh, part. We have an input set X. For each X, we have a set of candidate outputs, Y of X. It could be, so X could be sentences and Y of X could be parse trees or whatever. Um, so we are assuming that this is a structured set. So this is, again, structure prediction. Uh, and we are going to be concerned with linear models where the scores are you know, a linear function of a parameter vector theta and a joint input feature, uh, input output feature map phi. Um, and so to learn uh, the parameters theta, uh, we minimize a regularized empirical risk functional. So something that looks like this where you have a regularizer omega of theta and an empirical loss term, right, for any loss that we can your preferred loss here. And so, yeah, so in this talk, we're going to focus on the regularizer. Uh, yeah, it's, we also think that people have played a lot of time with different losses, but uh, there's still a lot of things to do regarding regularization. Uh, oh. So he said that uh, in the training, you want to find the data that will be my distance. But in, in the uh, when you generalize, you actually it's not enough that this term will be uh, small. You want it to be smaller, the smallest one over any alternative y. Uh, right, because you have this input output encoding. Oh, uh, so this is just so this is the, this entire thing is going to be the score of output y. This entire thing, this inner product here. And I'm just picking the output that maximizes this score. Yeah, but then in training, it's not enough just to say that you want to minimize it for the, you know, for the for true the why this should be small. Actually, you also need to have that for any alternative why this value will be large. Yeah, so, so this is inside the definition of the loss function. So this loss function could be like a hinge loss, where it will have like a, a max inside it, saying something like that, right? Or it could be like, you know, uh, logistic loss, where you model you know, conditional probability of y i given x. Does that make sense? So you, you could define this L as um, you know, like the margin, where the margin uses the yeah. all the alternatives. Yeah, yeah. So so this is like swapped inside this loss function. Uh, okay. So, all right, so let's see uh, what people have done uh, in regularization. So, so the most trivial choice is using L2 regularization, or the second most trivial, trivial is not using any regularization at all. Uh, and so this, uh, this has been done for quite a long time. It works really well, uh, even if some features are irrelevant, uh, you know, sometimes, some uh, combination of the features is relevant, and you can capture that phenomena really well. But it doesn't give you a sparse solution. So if you get about sparsity, this is not solving the problem. Uh, so another option is to use L1 regularization, uh, which in regression is called the lasso. Um, and this is encouraging sparsity, 
uh, and you know, we can then look at uh, the components of the weight vector that were zeroed out and uh, discard those features. So this is essentially allowing us to do feature selection. Uh, there are other examples, for example, elastic nets that combine L1 with L2. Um, you know, people have played with those things as well uh, in NLP. Uh, but so all, all these options are treating uh, each dimension of the feature space equally. So they all are ignoring the structure of the feature space. Uh, and so here, we, we want to promote structural patterns rather than just penalizing cardinality. And so using a, using a, simple, a simple example, suppose that we are just doing multi-class classification, so no, no structure prediction here. We have an input feature vector uh, that we call psi of x here. We have you know, like a vector of labels just that indicates the label of y. Uh, and we can consider, we can construct uh, features that are a conjunction of these two things, like an input feature conjoined with a label. This is something that people do commonly, right? Uh, and so you can represent the weight vector as a matrix, which is labels times input features. And so if you use L2, we'll get something which is dense, like this. So this is, you know, this, these colors are essentially showing the magnitude of the weight at each, at each, uh, for each feature. Uh, if you use L1, you get something which is sparse. So here the white squares mean zeros. So you get something that is sparse. But it's like random sparsity. It doesn't have any pattern. Uh, we may care about something like this, which is group sparse. Like, for example, we may want to discard entire uh, input features uh, if they are not relevant for any label. Uh, and so we are going to focus now on group sparsity. Um, so essentially, we, want, we, we, we allow density inside each group, but we want sparsity with respect to the groups that are selected. So in this case, each group is going to be a column in the matrix. Uh, and so how can we choose the groups? So here is uh, the opportunity to use our prior knowledge uh, about what kind of sparsity patterns we want in our model. Uh, so here is a general uh, formulation for that. Suppose that we have D features, uh, and we group them into M groups, uh, G1, G1 to GM, where each group is a subset of the features. And so we can then form parameter subvectors, theta 1 to theta M. Each of those things is a subvector which, is, uh, which corresponds to its own group. All right? uh, and so um, people have proposed using uh, this group lasso regularizer, uh, which essentially um, is going to penalize the sum of the L2 norms uh, of each, of each subvector. So for each subvector theta m, we take the L2 norm of that, not the squared norm, but the actual L2 norm, and then we take the sum of that. So this, you can regard this as the L1 norm of the L2 norms, right? So it, and it turns out that this is actually, a no, it's also a norm uh, that people call the mixed L1, L2 norm. Uh, and so, okay, so this is, uh, so if you use this regularizer, because this is the L2, the, the L1 of something, it's going to uh, promote sparsity at group level. It's, it's going to, to attempt to shrink some of these norms to zero, which will discard uh, all features inside this group. Uh, all right, so people have used these in statistics under different names, uh, like composite absolute penalties. They try to play with different norms, not just L1 and L2, uh, for example, the L, L infinity norm is something which is used here as well. Yes? Does it matter if certain groups are larger than one another? To, are they, they I'm going to get, yeah, it matters a lot. Uh, and I, I'd say that this is one of the main problems that need to be solved. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and so this leads me to this. So, <laughs> so in general, you want to penalize some groups more than others taking the you know, number of features in the group into account. But you don't, you have to specify there's some prior knowledge. Yeah, so in, in, this, in this talk I'm specifying that as, I'm, I'm assuming that is given, but it will be extremely interesting if uh, someone comes up with a way of setting this up automatically. Class labels are group class labels? Group what? Is a group a class label? Uh, group, uh, no, so, in, so it could be in the other example, but here uh, I'm going to consider general, so groups can be several different things, and I'm going to give several examples of groups. 
but yeah, so in the previous example, so this, in the previous slide, each group was, was a, uh, yeah, so each group was an, imp an input feature, f including all the labels conjoined with that feature. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, yeah, that's a good thing. Right, so, so there, there are three scenarios that we are going to consider. The first one is non-overlapping groups. Uh, then we're going to talk about three structured groups. And finally, the general case of graph structured groups. And they're going to start first with the non-overlapping case, which is the simplest. So in this case, the groups are all joined. Uh, which means that we require that each feature belongs exactly to one group. Um, and so we can recover uh, you know, the well-known regularizers that we already know by choosing some trivial uh, groups. For example, we can get L2 regularization back if you have one large group that has all the features there. We can recover L1 regularization if you have D singleton groups, one group per feature. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can also choose um, a non-trivial group and get something interesting like the label-based groups where the groups are the columns in, in the, of that matrix or template-based groups which is what I'm going to describe next. All right, so let me go into feature template selection. So suppose that you have a task like sequence labeling. Uh, so this is actually uh, chunking. Uh, so here uh, we have a sentence. Uh, we have parts of speech tags for each word in the sentence. This is input. And you want to predict uh, phrase boundaries. Like this means the beginning of a noun phrase, uh, which is we. This is uh, the beginning and inside a verb phrase. And so want to explore is a verb phrase and so forth. Okay? So this is a useful task in NLP. Um, and so typically people define feature templates uh, when they want to use a linear model to address this task. Uh, and so examples of feature templates are things like this. For example, for each position uh, in, the, in the sentence, they look at uh, word bigrams, for example, and conjoin that with a label. And so in that case, that will generate things like this, depending on which position you are. So this is just word bigrams. Uh, another example of a template would be part of speech trigrams, for example. Uh, if, you know, and depending on the, where you are, in which position you are, you can get different things like this. <coughs> <coughs> and so you may want to, to select feature templates. And to do that, we make each group correspond to a feature template. So you have a group for word bigrams and a group for you know, part of speech trigrams. So this notation means word at position zero, word at position one. This is relative to where we are. Okay? And the same thing for the parts of speech. And you can have some uh, other group there. Uh, which, is, which is going to be zeroed out if we apply these penalties. Uh, so it, this is a choice of groups that will allow us to, to do feature template selection. All right, so any questions so far about this? So that's presumably those templates are driven by some modeling knowledge that you yeah. have about like, interesting groups of features. So yeah, so uh, typically, you know, at this point people usually select feature templates by hand. Uh, they specify a bunch of feature templates. And we, we want like a method that allows you to specify or to construct you know, conjunctions of templates and all sorts of crazy things, and selecting the ones that are going to be useful for that task automatically. Okay, so okay, let's look now at three structured groups. Uh, so here we are going to allow some overlaps. Uh, but we are going to constrain the kind of overlaps that we get. If two groups overlap, we are going to require that one is contained in the other. In other words, we want groups to be nested. So you have this hierarchical structure. Uh, and so here's a, here's a, di a diagram that illustrates uh, what we want. It's something like this. So we define a new group inside the blue one, which is a green one, which, is a, which contains a subset of the features that are there. And you can represent that by drawing an arrow that goes from the blue one to the green one, uh, then we can assume that there is a violet group that subsumes these two, and so you draw these, and so forth. And you get a tree at the end, or a forest. It could be like a the joint set of trees. Uh, and so, ca can anyone tell me what kind of sparsity is this promoting? So what is going to happen if I use 
uh, group lasso with this definition of groups. Any guess? Well, you won't end up with um, you won't end up with singletons. Like you, you could like you won't be able to kill the purple guy without also killing the green and the brown yeah, guy. Exactly. Basically. So essentially, the sparsity pattern that is that is promote, being promoted here is that if a group is discarded, all descendant groups are also going to be discarded. As long as the as the regularizer's value is the sum of the subcomponent regularizer yeah. values. Uh, yeah, so this has been proposed or first proposed by, oh, actually the citation is on here. I think Janaton is the, so there is uh, some people working in with Francis Bach that uh, proposed using this sort of hierarchy uh, priors, where uh, hierarchical groups. Um, and they first, you know, have these, uh, show these diagrams that provide a nice graphical interpretation of what is going on. Uh, okay, so let's go to the general case where we allow for arbitrary overlaps. And so in that case, uh, we get a DAG. Uh, so this, this DAG is essentially uh, the Haas diagram of the post set structure of the feature space. Uh, so essentially by uh, you know, uh, defining um, a partial order based on set inclusion, like if, if one group is included into another group, we say that that group is less than or equal to the, to the other. Uh, we, we, can, we, we, we endow our feature space with the, with the structure of a post set. And we can represent that structure by, using the, by uh, drawing the Haas diagram. So essentially, if a node is a descendant of another node, that means that that group is included in the, in the ancestor group. Um, and so the sparsity patterns are given by this post set. It's just like the tree case. So if you discard, say, the red node, this is going to throw away the violet one, the orange one, and the black one, but not the green one. OK? Uh, OK. So this could be useful uh, if you want to do something like course to find regularization. And so here, um, we're going to focus on the partial order that we want to define in our feature space, and then define a regularizer that behaves according to that partial order. So we're going to say that um, uh, part of speech features are coarser than word features. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and then we're going to extend this partial order to, um, you know, we, we, because we have features that are going to be bigrams of part of speech or n grams of words, you're going to, is to extend this partial order uh, by extending this to n grams of parts of speech and n grams of words. So essentially we are saying that you know, a bigram of parts of speech is finer than just a single part of speech at that position. Uh, a word is finer than a part of speech. Uh, so uh, in this case, a word bigram is finer than a part of speech bigram, but also finer than just a word uh, in a smaller context. Okay, and so you get um, a post set like this, uh, and so the regularizer is going to, you know, promote uh, selecting uh, finer features only if the coarser ones are also going to be selected. A bit of an issue if the model could be influenced by something that's two steps away but not one step away. You know what I'm saying? So the, the 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 number of steps away doesn't matter much because. Uh, so, for example, a word trigram is still finer than a part of speech bigram, in overlapping that context. Trigram, unless you, uh, I, I don't know, I think you'd have to watch, about, have to watch how your steps are constructed potentially. Like, yeah, if it, if it was the case that you did have the fine feature connection, but not the mid-level connection ever, and that was supported by your data, you would, you would miss that. Yeah, right. And if the mid-level label, mid-level label is a mixture of interesting spaces, but it was kind of an XOR mixture, such that at the fine, at the coarser label, it didn't look like there was any information in that. Yeah. So it, it, it was the whole thing. Yeah, this, I, I don't know. That's yeah, it, it's conceivable that that you would want something like that, but uh, I, I think that in most cases you usually want something like this. Yeah, you might be able to structure your tree differently. Then. Yeah, so you exactly. have those yeah. separate yeah. alternatives yeah. then. then yeah. Yes. So in, in this problem, the, the, the most important feature was the trigram of the words, and all the other features are not important. Then basically, you are going to say every other feature are also important because of this hierarchy. 
Yeah, that's true. But but that, that's very unusual. Because uh, I mean, in most NLP problems, people need to include back off features. So it's it's not common that you care about the trigram, but you don't want to back off to a bigram or a unigram. So this sort of matches what people want. I mean, it maybe it doesn't solve it doesn't solve all problems, but I'm arguing that it's something reasonable uh, that we you may want. But the construction of the tree is important. I mean, it's a you know if you yeah. have the wrong tree. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so <laughs> this, this is your prior knowledge. It may happen that your prior knowledge is totally wrong, and you can specify a different. Uh, yeah, that's. That makes sense. You can essentially all thing that you need to specify is a partial order for your features. Now it depends on what partial order you want, right? And I wonder. I mean, like you can consider searching over, you know, different partial orderings, but then that might result in a different kind of overfitting, you know, from from the, you know for you. That's that's a good point. I guess you can sum regularizers corresponding to different partial orders, and that that would still be a group plus or regularizer with overlaps. Yeah, that's so good. Thing. Uh, oh, okay. So yeah, fifteen minutes. Left. Fifteen. Okay. So I should. Yeah. I should speak. All right. So uh, okay. Let's talk about algorithms wrapping up. Uh, so recall that this is the problem that you want to solve. We're going to solve it uh, using an online proximal gradient method. Uh, so this is similar to things like stochastic gradient descent, uh, but with a small twist. Uh, we are only taking gradients with respect to the loss function, and we are doing proximal steps with respect to the regularizer. Okay. Um, and so at, at each point, we turn in training pair, we do a gradient step looking at the loss for that example, just like stochastic gradient descent. And then we do a proximal step uh, that looks at the regularizer. So I need to say what the proximal step is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, this is what uh, the omega proximity operator is. So this is, you can regard it as a generalization of Euclidean projection. So if your regularizer is the indicator function of a set, of a convex set, uh, in other words, if it's zero, you know, if uh, xi belongs to a set, and minus and, and infinity otherwise, uh, this is exactly the same thing as projecting onto that set, right? Uh, but this is more general because if you have like uh, something which is not an indicator function, uh, like L1 regular, regularizer or something else, uh, this is something different. So essentially, we want um, uh, Xi to be close to to the point uh, that we started, uh, theta, but still you want to penalize the value uh, of the regularizer for that point. Uh, and so it turns out that uh, for many regularizers, uh, it's pretty easy to compute this proximal step. So for example, for L2 regularization, uh, this will become just a scaling operation. So there is some lambda which you can compute in closed form, such that the solution of this is going to be uh, you know, just scaling uh, theta. Uh, for L1, this is soft thresholding. So in other words, if, if, you are, if, you are, if our regularizer is a, a regularization constant tau times L1, uh, then this proximal step is just going to subtract. So if, if the weight is positive uh, at each uh, dimension, it's going to subtract an, a fixed amount of tau. Uh, if it crosses 0, it's clipped to 0. And the, the reversing if it's negative. So essentially, it's pushing everything to zero by subtracting or adding a fixed amount. That is essentially what is attached to the L1 norm. Uh, OK, so what about group L1? So in the non-overlapping case, the solution of this problem is what is called vector soft thresholding. So this is a generalization of soft thresholding that works at, at, uh, at, at um, uh, group level. So for, the, for group number M, uh, we're going to take the, M2 no, the L2 norm of that group, and we're going to shrink the norm. Uh, we're going to subtract this fixed amount of the M to that norm, OK? Um, by scaling everything inside that group to, to achieve that norm. And if by doing that we cross 0, we just set everything inside that group to 0. So this is essentially getting, discarding the entire group, right? 
Um, OK, so in the tree structured case, we can still compute the proximal step recursively. And there is this very nice paper, uh, Lips paper by Jenaton, where he shows how to do it. Uh, but uh, in the graphs, in the general case, so if you have something which is not a hierarchy, there's no e efficient procedure known to compute the proximal step. I mean, why, why go, uh, uh, and this proximal step thing is cool, but, like, but why not just take gradient steps in the whole oh, OK, objective? so the, the main reason for that is that that's not going to give you sparsity as you keep iterating your algorithm, right? So even with L1, uh, it's, it's, it's going to oscillate towards 0. But because there, it's not differentiable, the L1 norm, uh, you actually don't get the zeros, right? And so here, the proximal step is, you know, yeah. No, this, this matters a lot. Uh, so I have used gradient methods for L1. I mean, if you, I mean, if you do, if you play some tricks, like you can, I mean, they, okay, they won't be exactly zero, but you know, they get very, very low. Uh, yeah, but, but but as you keep doing the iterations, yeah. we never. So it takes a while until it figures out that it should be a zero there. Yeah, right? yeah no, I, mean, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. So if, so if you want to to have a low memory footprint, yeah, 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 yeah. And so this is something important because we care about the memory footprint here. Sure. I think another main reason is that for L1, this is not differentiable. So you yeah. go down by some grid method right yeah. now, worse covered in grid. Yeah. But, but doing the uh, proximal co uh, step, the capacity analysis is as if as a smooth function. Yes, because you don't have to worry it's about the place faster. where it's right, right around the, the actual. Yeah, that, 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 that's true, although in these yes. online methods, that is washed away in some sense. Yeah. So that if you use proximal gradient methods in, in batch, we can actually get the same you know, convergence of Nestor of methods uh, if the loss is, is uh, at least uh, Lipschitz continuous. But um, in, in the online setting, you don't get that. And how, and how do you know, so then I haven't seen this proximal step before, but, like, but how do you know how far to step for the proximal step part? Is there a like is there a oh is yeah, there right. So uh, that's going to be so that's going to yeah. Let me go back. So that that is going to depend on the on the learning rate on the, yeah, okay. on the eta, okay. which is a, which has to decrease. And that's scheduled. And yeah, that's scheduled as well. Okay. Yes. Does yeah. The same schedule as the gradient step for yeah, the yeah, gradient. Yeah. 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 You can also use a different one, I think, but okay. I just use the same. Uh, right. So okay. Uh, OK, so in the graph structured case, we cannot compute the proximal step. Uh, but so we show in, in the AI stats paper that you can still guarantee convergence, even if you don't compute the proximal step exactly. But as soon as you can uh, rewrite the proximal step as a, uh, if you can rewrite the regularizer as a sum of non-overlapping regularizers, you can apply re sequential proximal steps. This is not going to be, to be the same as the proximal step with respect to omega. But the algorithm will still be convergent. Uh, all right. So okay. So I'm just going to say a couple of things about you know, practical uh, issues. Um, so each gradient step is linear in the number of feature templates. Uh, if because I mean you're, I'm assuming that uh, for each uh, uh, data point. Uh, you have as many features firing as the number of templates that you have. Uh, each proximal step is linear in the number of groups because there are some smart things that you can do. You can uh, keep track of the norms of each group and use that for the updates. Uh, so everything is independent of the dimension of the feature space. So you can actually play with very large feature spaces here. Uh, there are some tricks that I you know, used, like keeping a budget of the number of groups that I want to keep instead of having a regularization constant. Uh, and then I just use perception as the loss to avoid having to tune another learning rate. And there is this very important final step of debiasing. So I run this for a few iterations. I identify the templates that are not zero. And then I just uh, train a standard unregularized learner at the second stage that does not consider the ones that were discarded. In practice, this is quite important. Why? That's surprising. I mean, why do you need to? Do so because, because it's, it's all the, objective, right? Thank you. the problem is that these kind of L1 penalties are introducing a bias to the model. Uh, and if you have strong regularization, which I'm doing here, it's biasing it more and more. And you would be better by having a, the second stage. So you're saying even if you 
when you reach the point of the sparse city that you care about, then still these these uh, proximal steps are affecting things enough that you're not getting to maybe the best solution you could with that level of sparsity. Yeah. That's uh, all right, so this is showing the memory efficiency, and this is why uh, it is important to use a, a proximal step here. So here, uh, you know, each of these things is like a different proximal step that is applied, and guarantees that you are discarding a lot of groups and keeping the memory footprint quite low. Uh, right. Yeah. So. Sorry, one last question about the proximal step. So when you're doing the soft thresholding thing, once some guy gets hits under the tau. And, and you knock it down to zero, is it gone forever? No. Uh, or no. can it, it can be pushed back out? So the group is not going on forever. You can, you can throw away the features and all the weights, but in the next round, you still need to compute the templates and all that. Uh, there are some heuristics that you could use, like, for example, if you're really sure that that group is never yeah, going to come back. Yeah. It's dangerous, but in practice, it could be useful. I never tried it, but... Uh, yeah, so the tasks were like chunking, like a sequence labeling task. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, but so, yeah, essentially we are achieving the same results, or slightly better actually, than L2 regularization um, with much fewer features and much fewer feature templates. This is also getting an impact in running in runtime, because if usually computing the scores is something which is linear in the number of feature templates. So if you have fewer feature templates, this is going to speed up the model. Uh, all right, so the second set of experiments was for dependency parsing. Uh, we have like a crazy number of feature templates, 600, uh, what is that? Oh yeah, 684. No one <laughs> uses so many. But the goal here is exactly to try to select a smaller number out of these uh, so many templates. And so you compared several things, like just using standard lasso uh, and, uh, and just the information gain score for selecting the templates. Um, and we got something like this. So essentially, uh, oh, so the blue line here uh, is group lasso wi wi without overlaps. The light blue one is course to find regularization. And so except for Spanish, it is, this didn't work for Spanish, but for the other ang languages, it did a good job. Uh, but the disappointing thing is that the course to find regularization didn't uh, outperform the just considering non overlapping groups. Okay. So, yeah, this, we were expecting that by you know, having that prior knowledge about the POSET could help, but it didn't. Uh, but there are a lot of things that we could play with here. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, you know, there are some claims that you could make about interpretability, looking at the different languages where we apply this, but you should be a little skeptical because it may happen that some patterns that we are identifying are properties of the data sets and not the languages. Uh, yeah. So essentially for ling languages that, are, uh, that have a rich morphology and the data sets are small, this seems to avoid using lexical features, which sort of makes sense because in this case there is a danger of overfitting. Uh, so this is, you know, in some sense, seeming to avoid overfitting. Um, okay. Regularization of those group weights across the different data sets. Oh yeah, yeah. like um, so the task. Yeah, like maintain maintain your weights, but like let the actual blockwise. Uh, yeah. Wise, uh, it's a, it's a, actually it's a good idea. Um, Unless you really believe that there's language dependent changes in, mm -hmm. in what's important, yeah. which might be the case. So that, that's actually a good idea because so you, you cannot do that with the actual features because they are going to be different, but, exactly. but with the templates you can. Yeah. So yeah, uh, to conclude, you have like two levels of structure here in the output space and the feature space. Uh, we can promote structure sparsity by using a group uh, lasso regularizer. So this algorithm that we propose uh, is able to explore very large feature spaces. Uh, and there is a lot of future work to do regarding this. And so I, I, I'd like to emphasize this prior group weight thing, which is quite important. So here we just um, define that as like the log of the number of features in the group, which you can say that it's like the number of bits that you need to encode a feature in the group, but it's a heuristic, right? So there's a chance that you could do better by doing something uh, smarter here. Uh, so if anyone has ideas about how to do that, I'll be happy to hear about that. 
Uh, yeah, so that's all I have. Do you, do you tell me something about the result before devising? I'm sorry? Before devising? Before devising? Yes. So how come the result did you get? Oh, very bad result. Very bad. Because I'm, I'm doing very strong verbalization. The next 17. Uh, I actually like him in the I, Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, it's like a huge drop, like five percentual points or something like that. But, but it's also because of the algorithm that I'm using. If I use like batch methods, it's probably better because I, you know, it, it has to do with the technique that I'm using to define the regularization constant. Cool, thanks. Sure, thanks.